Hey gang, welcome back. Here we are on week 11 already. This semester is just zooming along. So we are talking about some of the glamorous components of marketing in this week, week 11's lecture, specifically some different types of ads, advertising types, and some challenges associated with sales promotion. So just to recap where we're at. So this semester, we've been walking through the four P's of marketing all semester. So that's product, price, place, and here we are in week 11 and we're talking about promotion and under promotion also known as the promotional mix we have advertising public relations personal sales and sales promotion last week in week 10 we covered public relations and in this lecture we're talking about advertising and sales promotion and in another lecture we will cover off on personal sales salespeople okay so this is the glamorous stuff. This is what people think about when they think of, uh, oh, you're in marketing, this is what you do. We now know that marketing is responsible for a lot of other things as well. Let's go ahead and dive in. You have three learning objectives this week. Know the different types of advertisements. And this is from the objective of the advertisement. Be able to recall the trends in digital advertising. So I'm gonna highlight how that's shifting around as far as where ad budgets are being spent. And then third, know some of the common challenges associated with sales promotion. Here we go. So there's a lot of different ad types. Now, when I talk about the different ad types, it's about the purpose of the ad, not like here you see on, on the left, you've got a print ad for Hershey's Dark Chocolate, and this is saying um, buy ours, not theirs. This is a uh, compare this is a competitive comparative ad and then up above you see an outdoor board that's the type of media one's a print ad one's an outdoor board what we're talking about by types of ads in this lecture is what's the intent what's the purpose what's the strategy uh, what's the goal of the ad type and when we think about um, different advertising methods, you know, not all ads lead directly to a sale. Sometimes you're just trying to build awareness for your brand. And we know from the consumer buying behavior lectures that I did earlier in the course, we kind of have to move people through some steps. So it's pretty rare that one ad, one purchase right out of the gate, customers have to become aware of you. They have to get interested in what you're talking about. They have to go through some type of evaluation of your brand and compare you to other brands. They have to make a decision at point of sale. And then after the, after the purchase, we continue with some confirmation pieces. So there's ads that strike at each of these chords along the way. And these aren't hard set categories. Some ads do multiple things, but just know that each ad has a different objective. All right, so this slide talks about some of the common different types of ads. And there's really two main categories. Most of the advertising that we see is product advertising. They're promoting a specific product. And there's a second category that's called institutional advertising, and I'll get to that in a minute. So but let's talk about the product advertising first. So under product advertising, you can have a pioneering ad, a competitive ad, uh, or a reminder ad. So Pioneering advertising is when you're advertising a whole new product category. It was years ago, but IBM, which used to be a computer manufacturing company, and now they're a technology consulting, business consulting company. But IBM uh, got pretty involved in cloud computing and setting up cloud systems. Now, obviously, with Google Drive and Dropbox and Evernote and all these places, pretty much there's lots of options for digital storage now. But IBM was running a series of ads called, you know, what's the cloud? Put it in the cloud and had business people and, you know, kind of scenes of, we don't know what the cloud is, it's the future. Because back then people weren't used to this concept of, you can store all of your files off in this ether digital space versus having to put it on some type of hard drive or flash disk or something of that nature. 
and also all your software and everything is kind of hosted in the cloud and you don't have to load software onto your computer etc so when IBM ran that ad that was an example of pioneering advertising they're trying to get people aware of this new product category and that it's a cool idea Apple ran uh, what was called the silhouette ads many years ago where it showed people walking down the street with uh, an MP player you know playing music in their ears and they uh, and then uh, the person is just walking, but then the silhouette that's going on the wall behind them is a silhouette of somebody dancing. So what is saying, you know, basically, you know, on the exterior, I look just like a regular pedestrian, but in my head, I'm actually dancing because I've got this cool new digital music technology that I'm listening to. So that was pioneering advertising as well. So with pioneering advertising is for new products, new product categories. We're trying to convince the general audience that this is a cool idea. Most of the ads that we see are in this middle category of competitive advertising. Buy ours, not theirs, right? So, and underneath competitive advertising, one type of, comp of competitive ad is the comparative ad. That's when you're actually comparing yourself to another brand. So it might be the, the Kia Sorento with more cup holders than the BMW M, you know, BMW M series. So they're comparing themselves to another brand. Now, when you compare yourself to another brand, you are giving them some media exposure, but you're trying to say we're as good as, if not better than this other, and it's oftentimes a superior brand. So comparative advertising, you have to make sure those claims are accurate or you're probably gonna get sued in that advertisement by the competitor for making false claims. If you have a well-known brand name that's established in the marketplace, then you can run reminder advertising. Reminder advertising is just letting people know that you're out there as a brand. You're not pushing really a specific product, so it's not technically product advertising. You're just reminding people that you exist. So M&M's has done this for a long time, and I think in some subsequent slides I show you that where they got the picture of the little M&M people. Uh, you know, they're not showing you a bag of M&Ms and pouring the M&Ms out into a cup and showing somebody eating them. They're just showing kind of the mascots of the company, if you will. Or if it's Target, the retail store, they would just have the, the red Target logo maybe on the side of a building or on a billboard, not mentioning any offers or products. That's reminder advertising. And that tends to be in the realm of well-entrenched brand names. So that's product advertising. And then there's another category called institutional advertising. And institutional advertising is when you're running ads about the good works that the company does. So it's kind of promoting the corporate social responsibility efforts of the company as opposed to hawking specific products. So this is an example of McDonald's running an ad that features their Ronald McDonald house during the holidays. And hey, won't you help us and give money to the Ronald McDonald house? That's an institutional ad. Or it's Budweiser running an ad uh, that shows the Clydesdales. Uh, it tends to be companies focusing on the good works that they do. And maybe the, the, the foundation, which is a nonprofit kind of division of a company focusing on the things that they do. When I was a kid, we had Shell Oil and they used to run a bunch of ads called uh, the Shell Answer Man. And, you know, it would be uh, running ads about how do I, how do I uh, uh, use my car more efficiently? How do I do things that are good for the environment? Shell used to run ads that, you know, would say, you know, we own this land here, but we're not going to drill for oil here. Um, we're gonna leave it set aside for nature to protect this bird. And they would run an ad on that. They were probably legally required by the Environmental Protection Agency to not drill on that land, but they went ahead and made an ad about it, right? So that's institutional advertising, focusing on the good works that the company does. Product advertising, institutional advertising, and you see some of the subsets here of product advertising. Pioneering, competitive, and reminder. 
So here's an example of a comparative ad. So again, if you're like a lower price point, lower perceived quality brand, you're going to use a comparative ad to improve your perceived value and quality of your product by comparing you to a superior brand. So here's Suave, which is kind of a, a lower price point uh, shampoo. And uh, they're comparing themselves uh, to Nexus Humectris, which is a much more expensive product. And they're saying, hey, we're 14 bucks less. So that is a straightforward comparative ad. And you have to be careful as an advertiser if you run comparative ads, because if any of your language is incorrect, uh, price points, discounts, like I said before, you're probably going to get sued for a, um, a libel lawsuit you know, uh, that you're making false claims about the company. I mentioned M&Ms earlier, so here's an example of a reminder ad. It's a well-known brand name. So, you know, they're just saying, we're out there, we're here. They're not pushing overtly a product. They're promoting the brand itself. And then the third category is institutional ads. So this tends to be big companies, and oftentimes it's companies that maybe aren't the most beloved by the public like Dow Chemicals or British Petroleum Oil or uh, you know beer and tobacco and firearm companies um, that some people don't like. So these big companies, it's almost like they're doing public relations, except they're doing it through an actual advertisement and they're paying for that ad. So uh, they're talking about the causes and the ideas that the company supports and it's trying to shed a favorable light on look how eco groovy and corp you know how socially responsible we are as a company they'll do this through csr efforts press releases and events but they might actually for bigger companies when they have the budget to do so also run institutional ads about these efforts so that's advertising the other thing i wanted to add in here is uh, just giving you some current numbers on ad spending by media type. And I apologize that my face here is, is cropping off of that uh, out of home, which is the yellow number there. But take a minute and look at this graph. This is from Statista.com. And this is looking at the changes in ad spending by type of media from 2010 up to uh, 2020. And in the bottom there, you see the blue, which is digital advertising. So that's everything on computers, social media. This category has grown quite a bit. The second category in your stacked bar there with the darker blue is TV. And we see that TV has been shrinking. And in fact, finally, in 2017, that was the year that um, digital advertising surpassed TV in total spending. So, uh, you know, the future of traditional TV, which has been the biggest hammer in advertising pretty much since the 50s is going to change probably in your lifetime as companies like Facebook and YouTube are working to basically create broadcast capability for their advertisers on their platforms. Facebook has Facebook Live, makes you basically enable to have your own TV station and broadcast out to all your people. So the future of TV, we'll see how it goes. And you can see some of the other categories here. Uh, newspapers in the green definitely dying out and on their way down, and they have been for a while. Uh, still alive, but I think as all the baby boomers kind of age out of the population, we might see the end of traditional printed newspapers. And then when we look specifically at digital advertising spending, I've got a graph here and this is um, uh, from Cohen and Company and this looks at uh, spending by device and format so what you're seeing here is obviously a growth in mobile so look at the look at the big leaps in uh, mobile ad spend so advertisers have realized that the best way to advertise is when people are out with their phone getting ready to buy something right now uh, people are less inclined now to be at their computer and shop sometimes if you're at home, but definitely an increase in mobile spend. 
and you can see the numbers listed there for those shifts. So desktop still strong, but it's not increasing at the same rate as mobile advertising is. And then you're also seeing if you look down at video, so certainly there's uh, pushing more towards video. Video has higher engagement. So if you think about it, what are you most likely to look at and consume when you're on your computer? Is it going to be a video like me here, uh, or is it going to be a bunch of text on a post? So video has higher engagement numbers. So that's some numbers on uh, spending by device. And then here we see the revenue by company. No big surprises here. Look at these two 100 pound gorillas in the digital ad space, so like Google and Facebook. And you see some other international companies listed here. Um, Tencent is in China. Um, <clears throat> so in 2017, you know, Google and Facebook alone, those two, um, huge numbers on uh, capturing ad revenue. And it continues to grow. So they basically eclipse uh, the other companies. And look at the total digital ad spending in billions. That number keeps going up. So 223 billion in 2017. And you know by 2019 we'll be close to almost 300 billion dollars. So that's a little bit about some of the different ad formats and how the spending is going in the digital space. So next up, let's talk about sales promotion. We've already talked about sales promotion quite a bit when we talked about integrated marketing campaigns, and you're looking at all the different types of sales promotion tactics in those earlier lectures like sampling and discounts and coupons and special events. So here's Red Bull, which has promoted their brand a lot through special events like the flu tag competition where people try to fly off of this off of this float and they all crash into the water and it's a perfect fit for Red Bull because Red Bull gives you wings and in this case people uh, crash into the into the water but it's all sponsored by Red Bull so this type of special event is an example of sales promotion so sales promotion is different than the other promotional mix items and again those other promotional mix items are advertising PR and personal sales. Straight up advertising, uh, a controlled message with the name sponsor, public relations, free exposure, you gotta have a, a media hook to get coverage. Personal sales, salespeople when your product has a lot of risk, direct spoken communication between buyer and seller. And then sales promotion. Sales promotion is more of a carnival category to try to get people to try your product, generate some buzz, uh, a shot in the arm, get some sales right now. Contests, sweepstakes, coupons, special events, sampling um, are all under the sales promotion category. But sales promotion has some risks and some challenges. And you see a couple of these listed here. As I touched on in the integrated marketing campaign lecture, when you use sales promotion heavily, as a company, you can start watering down your brand. Because essentially, if you're constantly discounting your products, hey, here's a coupon, come on in and buy our product, normally this price, now it's reduced to this price. Eventually, you erode brand loyalty and you turn your customers into coupon shoppers. They're gonna be trained and wait for the discount. So sales promotion is meant to be a temporary short-term strategy to stimulate sales right now. Maybe you're launching a new product or you're going into a new market and you need to generate some trial of your new product uh, or your brand in a new market. That's when sales promotion makes sense. It's not meant to be a permanent component of your marketing strategy. You can erode brand loyalty if you do. It's hard to manage. So that means specifically that when you have sales promotions, if you think about it, something as simple as a coupon offer, well, somebody has that coupon, maybe it's digital and it's on their phone and they bring it into the register. The register person needs to be aware of that coupon and be trained how to process that coupon. And that coupon needs to show up on the point of sale 
on their register system, right? So, so you have to have information systems involved. So as a marketer, marketing and operations sometimes butt heads. And when they do, it's oftentimes around sales promotion. Marketing comes up with all these crazy events and discount offers. But then the people at the front lines in the store who actually have to process coupons and, and deal with these promotional activities, it adds to the burden of, of their jobs already. And so, you know, a retail store manager isn't going to be that as excited about a sales promotion. If you're the marketing director for that company, they're just seeing it as here's another thing that I have to handle and process and things can go wrong and it can slow down my registers and increase the wait times at my at my checkout lines etc so they can be hard to manage there's also the fulfillment piece in the back end if people are entering to win contests and then they win how does all of that get managed typically there's fulfillment companies that will ship all that stuff out for you so there's professional organizations it's not really for amateurs to try to put these together on your own because they get complex quickly there's state guidelines sometimes on contests and sweepstakes. You know, for example, in California, no purchase necessary to enter a contest. So they might have something like, you know, enter our, our uh, scratch and win. You know, it's peel this off of a cup if you're getting a beverage. Um, with any purchase, you're entered into this contest. But you'll see there's fine print there. And legally, they can't mandate that you have to buy something to be part of that sales promotion. So somebody com could come in and, you know, on an index card, say, I want to be part of this promotion and put it in there. Um, they probably just take that index card and throw it in the trash, but, <laughs> but they are supposed to be entered to win. So there's need for alternatives. You don't always just want to use sales promotion. And frankly, if you have a business that is using sales promotion heavily, and I'm talking mostly about discounts and coupons, it's probably a sign that there's something wrong with the brand. So you are becoming dependent on sales promotion to keep people to come into your stores and you're having to discount your products to keep traffic going. So um, the real solution is to, is to build a brand and a product and service offering that you don't have to discount. So, but sales promotion is good. Again, if you're going into new markets or launching a new product, um, there is a time and a place for sales promotion activities. Okay, so this week's assignments are pretty light. So uh, you have a quiz and then you also have the next step of your marketing plan this week, hence less assignments. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.